23rd. The weather has continued wet and rainy about half past three. The emperor sent for me to his chamber. He was dressing himself. He had been seriously indisposed, but thanks to his mode of treating himself, he said, and to his hermetical seclusion of the preceding day, his complaint was over. He was again well. I dared to express my sincere grief. I had inscribed, I said, an unhappy day in my journal. I should have marked it in red ink and when he learned what it was what in fact he said is it the only day since we left france in which you have not seen me and you were the only one and after some seconds of silence he added in a tone peculiarly adapted to make me amends if that were possible but my dearest causes if you set such a value on it if you considered of so much moment why did you not come and knock at my door? I am not ins inaccessible to you. The doctor was introduced. He assured us that the governor had promised never again to set foot at Longwood. It was ironically observed by one of us that he began to make himself agreeable. The emperor then went to his library where a long letter I had written in Rome was read to him by my son. He was driven out by the wet and on his way to the saloon and billiard room he was tempted by the sight of steps to walk a little i know he said i am doing what is not prudent happily the wet weather forced him to return almost instantly he took a seat in the saloon where there was a good fire called for some orange leaf at sand and played some games of chess after dinner the emperor read Montmartre tells tales and stopped at that of the self-styled philosopher. He still coughed a great deal and again called for some of the same bits of sign. He entered into a long and most interesting review of Jean Jacques, of his talents, his influence, his eccentricities, his private vices. He retired at 10 o'clock. I regret very much that I cannot now recollect the particulars relative to all these objects. In the course of the day, Mr. de Montalon addressed the following official answer to the governor, who had sent a letter respecting the commissioners of the Allied powers and the embarrassed state of his finances. It is the letter, which I have already noticed, the 18th of this month. Official document. General, I have received a treaty of the 2nd of August, 1815, concluded between His Britannic Majesty and the Emperor of Austria, the Emperor of Russia, and the King of Prussia, which is annexed to your letter to the 23rd of July. The Emperor Napoleon protests against the purport of that treaty. He is not the prisoner of England. After having placed his abdication in the hands of the representatives of the nation for the benefit of the Constitution, adopted by the French people and in favor of his son he proceeded voluntarily and freely to England for the purpose of residing there as a private person in retirement under the protection of British laws the violation of all laws cannot constitute a right in fact the person of the Emperor Napoleon is in the power of England but neither as a matter of fact nor of right has it been or is it at present in the power of Austria, Russia, and Prussia, even according to the laws and customs of England, which has never included in its exchange of prisoners, Russians, Austrians, Prussians, Spaniards, or Portuguese, although united to these powers by treaties of alliance and making war conjointly with them, the convention of the, the 2nd of August made 15 days after the Emperor Napoleon had arrived in England, cannot as a matter of right have any effect. It merely presents the spectacle of the coalition of the four principal powers of Europe for the oppression of a single man, a coalition which the opinion of every people disavows as to all the principles of sound morality. The emperors of Austria and Russia and the king of Prussia, not possessing either in fact or by right any power over the person of the emperor Napoleon, were incapable of enacting anything with regard to him. If the emperor Napoleon had been in the power of the emperor of Austria, that prince would have remembered the relations formed by religion and nature between a father and a son, relations which are never violated with impunity 
Timothy, he would have remembered that four times Napoleon reestablished him on his throne at Loban in 1797, at Lunaville in 1801, when his armies were under the walls of Vienna, at Pressburg in 1806, and at Vienna in 1809, when his armies were in possession of the capital and of three-fourths of the monarchy. That prince would have remembered the protestations which he made to him at the bivouac of Moravia in 1806 and at the interview at Dresden in 1812. If the person of the Emperor Napoleon had been in the power of the Emperor Alexander, he would have remembered the ties of friendship contracted at Tilsit at Erfurt and during 12 years of daily intercourse. He would have remembered the conduct of the Emperor Napoleon the day subsequent to the Battle of Austerlitz when having it in his power to take him prisoner with the remains of his army, he contented himself with his word and let him effect his retreat. He would have remembered the dangers to which the Emperor Napoleon personally exposed himself to extinguish the fire of Moscow and preserve that capital for him. Unquestionably, that prince would not have violated the duties of friendship and gratitude towards a friend in distress. If the person of the Emperor Napoleon had been even in the power of the King of Prussia, that sovereign would not have forgotten that it was optional with the Emperor after the Battle of Friedland to place another prince on the throne of Berlin. He would not have forgotten in the presence of a disarmed enemy the protestations of devotedness and the sentiments which he expressed to him in 1812 at the interviews at Dresden. It is accordingly evident from the second and fifth articles of the said treaty that being incapable of any influence whatever over the fate and the person of the Emperor Napoleon, who is not in their power. These princes refer themselves in that respect to the future conduct of his Britannic Majesty, who undertakes to fulfill all obligations. These princes have reproached the Emperor Napoleon with preferring the protection of the English laws to theirs, the false ideas which the Emperor Napoleon entertained of the liberality of the English laws and of the influence of a great, generous, and free people in his government, decided him in preferring the protection of these laws to that of his father-in-law or his old friend. The Emperor Napoleon always would have been able to obtain the security of what related personally to himself, whether by placing himself again at the head of the Army of the Loire or by putting himself at the head of the Army of the Gironda, commanded by General Clausel, but looking for the future only to retirement and to the protection of the laws of a free nation, either in English or America. All stipulations appeared useless to him. He thought that the English people would have been more bound by his frank conduct, which was noble and full of confidence, than it could have been by the most solemn treaties. He has been deceived, but this delusion will forever excite the indignation of real Britons, and with the present, as well as future generations, it will be a proof of the perfidy of the English administration. Austrian and Russian commissioners are arrived at St. Helena, if the object of their mission be to fulfill part of the duties which the emperors of Austria and Russia have contracted by the treaty of the 2nd of August, and to take care that the English agents in a small colony in the middle of the ocean do not fail in the attentions due to a prince connected with them by the ties of affinity, by so many relations, the characteristics of these two sovereigns will be recognized in that measure. But you, sir, have asserted that these commissioners possess neither the right nor the power of gaining any opinion on whatever may be transacted on this rock. The English ministry have caused the Emperor Napoleon to be transported to St. Helena, 2,000 leagues from Europe. This rock situated under the tropic at the distance of 500 leagues from every kind of continent is in that latitude exposed to a devouring heat. It is during three-fourths of the year covered with clouds and mist. It is at once the driest and wettest country in the world. This is the most inimical climate. Two, the emperor's health. It is hatred which dictated the selection of this residence as well as the instructions given by the English ministry to the officers who commanded this country. They have been ordered to call the emperor Napoleon general, being desirous of compelling him to acknowledge that he never reigned in France, which decided him not to take an incognito title as he had determined in quitting France. First magistrate for life under the title or first consul, he concluded the preliminaries of London and the Treaty of Amiens with the great king of 
Great Britain, he received as ambassadors Lord Cornwallis, Mr. Mary, and Lord Whitworth, who resided in that quality at his court. He sent to the King of England, Count Otto, and General Andriasi, who resided as ambassadors at the court of Windsor. When, after the exchange of letters between the ministers for foreign affairs belonging to the two monarchies, Lord Lauderdale came to Paris, provided with full powers from the King of England, he treated with the plenipotentiaries, provided with full powers from Emperor Napoleon, and resided at several months at the court of the Tuileries, when afterwards the Chateau Lord Castlereagh signed the ultimatum which the Allied powers presented to the plenipotentiaries of the Emperor Napoleon. He thereby recognized the Fourth Dynasty. That ultimatum was more advantageous than the Treaty of Paris, but France was required to renounce Belgium and the left bank of the Rhine, which is contrary to the propositions of Frankfurt and to the proclamations of the Allied powers, and was also contrary to the oath by which, at his consecration, the emperor had sworn the integrity of the empire. The emperor then thought these national limits were necessary to the security of France as well as to the equilibrium of Europe. He thought that the French nation, in the circumstances under which she found herself, ought rather to risk every chance of war than to give them up. France would have obtained that integrity and with it preserved her honor. Had not treason contributed to the success of the Allies, the Treaty of the 2nd of August and the Bill of the British Parliament style the Emperor Napoleon of Bonaparte and give him only the title of general. The title of General Bonaparte is no doubt eminently glorious. The Emperor bore it at Lodi, at Castiglione, at Rivoli, at Ercole, at Loman, at the Pyramids, and at Abukir, but for 17 years he has borne that of first consul and of emperor. It would be an admission that he has been neither first magistrate of the republic nor its sovereign of the fourth dynasty. Those who think that nations are phalaks, which by divine right belong to some families, are neither of the present age nor of the spirit of the English legislature, which has several times changed the succession of its dynasties because of the great alterations occasioned by opinions in which the reigning princes did not participate had made them enemies to the happiness of the great majority of that nation, for kings are but hereditary magistrates who exist but for the happiness of nations, and not nations for the satisfaction of kings. It is the same spirit of hatred which directed that the Emperor Napoleon should not write nor receive any letter without its being opened and read by the English ministers and the officers of St. Helena. He has, by that regulation, been interdicted the possibility of receiving intelligence from his mother, his wife, his son, his brothers, and when wishing to free himself from the inconvenience of having his letters read by inferior officers, he desired to send sealed letters to the Prince Regent. He was told that open letters only could be taken charge of and conveyed, and that such were the instructions of the ministry. That measure stands in need of no comment. It will suggest strange ideas of the spirit of the administration by which it was dictated. It would be disclaimed even at Algiers. Letters have been received for general officers in the Emperor's suite. They were open and delivered to you. You have retained them because they had not been transmitted through the medium of the English ministry. It was found necessary to make them travel 4,000 leagues over again. And these officers had the misfortune to know that there existed on this rock news from their wives, their mothers, and their children. And that they could not be put in possession of it in less than six months. The heart revolts. Permission could not be obtained to subscribe to the Morning Chronicle, to the Morning Post, or to some French journals. Some broken numbers of the Times have been occasionally sent to Longwood in consequence of the demand made on board of the North Armour and some books have been sent. But all those which relate to the transactions of late years have been carefully kept back. It was since intended to open a correspondence with a London bookseller for the purpose of being directly supplied with books which might be wanted and with those relative to the events of the day. That intention was frustrated. An English author, having published at London an account of his travels in France, took the trouble to send it as a present to the emperor. But did you did not think yourself authorized to deliver it to him because it had not reached you through the channel of your government. 
It is also said that other books sent by their authors have not been delivered because the address of some was to the Emperor Napoleon and of others to Napoleon the Great. The English ministry are not authorized to order any of these vexations. The law, however unjust, considers the Emperor Napoleon as a prisoner of war. The prisoners of war have never been prohibited from subscribing to the journals or receiving books that are printed. Such a prohibition is exercised only in the dungeons of the Inquisition. The island of St. Helena is ten leagues in circumference. It is everywhere inaccessible. The coast is guarded by brigs. Posts within sight of each other are placed on the shore, and all communication with the sea is rendered impracticable. There is but one small town, Jamestown, where the vessels anchor from which they sail. In order to prevent the escape of an individual, it is sufficient to guard the coast by land and sea. By interdicting the interior of the island, one object only can be in view, that of preventing a ride of eight or ten miles, which it would be impossible to take on horseback and the privation of which, according to the consultations of medical men, is abridging the emperor's days. The emperor has been placed at Longwood, which is exposed to every wind, a barren piece of ground, uninhabited, without water, and incapable of any kind of cultivation. The space contains about 1,200 uncultivated fathoms at the distance of 11 or 12 Hundred fathoms. A camp was established on a small eminence, and other has been since placed nearly at the same distance in an opposite direction, so that in the intense heat of the tropic, whatever way the eye is directed, nothing is seen but encampments. Admiral Malcolm perceiving the utility of which a tent would be to the emperor in that situation, has had one pitched by his seamen at the distance of 20 paces from the house. It is the only spot in which shade is to be found. The emperor has, however, every reason to be satisfied with the spirit which animates the officers and soldiers of the gallant 53rd, as he had been with the crew of the Northumberland. Longwood House was constructed to serve as a barn to the company's farm. Some apartments were afterwards made in it by the deputy governor of the island. He used it for a country house, but it was in no respect adapted for a residence. During the year, it has been inhabited. It has always been in want of repair, and the emperor has been constantly exposed to inconvenience and unwholesomeness of a house in which workmen are employed. His bedchamber is too small to contain a bedstead of ordinary size, but every kind of building at Longwood would prolong the inconvenience arising from the workmen employed. There are, however, in this wretched island, some beautiful situations with fine trees, gardens, and tolerably good houses, among others plantation house. But you are prevented by the positive instructions of the ministry from granting this house, which would have saved a great deal of expense laid out in building at Longwood. Hods covered with pitched paper, which are no longer of any use. You have prohibited every kind of intercourse between us and the inhabitants of the island. You have, in fact, converted Longwood House into a secret prison. You have even thrown difficulties in the way of our communication with the officers of the garrison. Uh, the most anxious care would seem to be taken to deprive us of the few resources afforded by this miserable country, and we are no better off here then we should be on Ascension Rock. During the four months you have been at St. Helena, you have surrendered the Emperor's condition worse. It was observed to you by Count Bertrand that you violated the law of your legislature, that you trampled upon the privileges of general officers, prisoners of war. You answered that you knew nothing but the letter of your instructions and that they were still worse than your conduct appeared to us. Count de Montalon. P.S. I had, sir, signed this letter when I received yours of the 17th, to which you annex the estimate of an annual sum of 20,000 sterling, which you consider indispensable to meet the expenses of the establishment of Longwood after having made all the reductions which you have thought possible. The consideration of this estimate can in no respect concern us. The Empress table is scarcely supplied with what is necessary. All the provisions are bad quality and four times the years than at Paris. You require a fund of 12,000 pounds sterling from the Emperor as your government only allows you 8,000 pounds for all expenses. 
I have had the honor of telling you that the emperor had no funds, that no letter had been received or written for a year, and that he was altogether unacquainted with what is passing or what may have passed in Europe, transplanted by violence to this rock at the distance of 2,000 leagues without being able to receive or write any letter. He now finds himself at the discretion of the English agents. The emperor has uniformly desired and still desires to provide himself for all his expenses of every nature, and he will do so as speedily as you shall give possibility to the means by taking off the prohibition laid upon the merchants of the island of carrying on his correspondence and releasing it from all kind of inquisition on your part or on that of your agents. The moment of the emperor's wants shall be known in Europe, the persons whose interest themselves for him will transmit the necessary funds for his supplies. The letter of Lord Bathurst, which you have communicated to me, gives rise to strange ideas. Can you ministers then be so ignorant as not to know that the spectacle of a great man struggling with adversity is the most sublime of spectacles? Can they be ignorant that Napoleon at St. Helena, in the midst of persecutions of every kind against which his serenity is his only shield, is greater, more sacred, more venerable than on the first throne of the world, where he was so long the arbiter of kings. Those who fail in respect to Napoleon thus situated merely degrade their own character. And the nation which they represent 